three lives lost, dozens injured, and a city left in shock. The New Orleans Hard Rock Hotel collapsed in a catastrophic event that changed the skyline of the city forever. Panic ensues among a group of tourists as a sudden loud rumble shakes their streetcar. They watch a giant steel structure fall from the construction site directly in front of them. The crash is followed by a massive cloud of dust that engulfs the entire area. Abruptly, a lively street transforms into a chaotic scene. Tourists and disoriented passers-by are breaking through the cloud of dust, trying to find a safe corner of the street. No one knows what happened and if they're still in danger. Only after the dust settles do they discover the top half of the nearby Hard Rock Hotel construction site in ruins. From the unfinished building, dozens of construction workers run out to the street, some of them injured, and people are still inside. The scene is absolutely disastrous. It appears the structure collapsed on its own, but the investigation into the accident would reveal the dark secret of how New Orleans buildings are constructed. A ruined building was not what Hard Rock Hotel investors envisioned when they revealed the project. At the site of the former Woolworths store, they planned to erect a $70 million hotel with 350 rooms. It was expected to be profitable to both investors and the neighborhood. Still, the project encountered controversy and lengthy delays from the beginning of the development process. Only some were happy to see a brand new shiny 19-story building at the very edge of the historic French district. Concerned citizens feared that the hotel would disrupt the architectural entirety of the neighborhood. The project was, in fact, severely violating city regulations. The 190-foot-tall hotel was to be built in the 70-foot limit zone. Ultimately, the investor won the dispute because of the project's profitability. In February 2018, while the site was still making little progress, they altered the original plans and increased the height of the building to 205 feet. However, this time, the New Orleans City Council found that the investor was pushing too far with their plans and voted to adhere to the previously approved height of 190 feet. Whatever modifications the designer made had to be kept within the already established proportions. It seemed like a reasonable decision, but in reality, it paved the way for the disaster. The city council's ruling didn't hinder the construction progress. The building's designer, Heaslip Engineering, decided to make changes along the way. Eight days before the collapse, the workers poured the last batch of concrete into a metal decking structure. On October 12, 2019, the construction of the 18th floor was in progress. It was yet another ordinary working day with crews engaged at all levels. But two hours into the workday, the building began to tremble. Before the workers realized where the shake was coming from, the northern corner of the structure started to collapse. In a domino effect, it dragged along the entire top edge. One after another, the ten topmost floors of that section crumbled under the weight of collapsing concrete slabs. Huge chunks of concrete showered Rampart Street, forcing passers-by to run for cover. The massive steel construction of the temporary elevator attached to the building lost support and toppled. It smashed into the street and the Sanger Theater across the way. The building collapsed on a Saturday morning when the street was relatively quiet, with just a few vehicles and pedestrians. Fortunately, no passers-by were injured, but the workers inside were not that lucky. The collapse caught them by complete surprise. A surveillance video from a nearby building shows a group of men working on the top of the hotel when it started to give way. It took them a couple of seconds from when the corner of the building began to cave in before they started running away. In a state of panic and unsure of what would happen next, they ran to the opposite side of the structure. Another worker was too close to the section that collapsed and unable to escape in time. 
Numerous workers were inside the building, with a significant portion working in the section that ultimately collapsed. Only a group of employees on the ground floor managed to evacuate the premises. It was only after they had reached a safe distance that they saw the building in ruins. They were left to wonder about the fate of their colleagues, who were still inside. It took several minutes after the disaster for an alarm to be raised for the emergency crews in the city. A dispatcher broadcast an alert to the New Orleans Fire Department. Floors collapsed down. The reports of someone possibly trapped in the building. The first responders' reaction was swift. They rushed to the scene, knowing that in such disasters, every second could save the life of a person trapped under the rubble. Once there, they stormed into the building and started sweeping it for survivors. On the fifth and sixth floor, we're going to have people trapped up there. We're going to have to get a ladder truck. The further up they went, the more serious the situation was. On the eighth floor, they found the first person trapped in ruins. And we're on the eighth floor. We got one person trapped by rubble. We're attempting to get him out right now. He is so hot. It was a steel worker. Derek Pate. Pate was lucky to survive the collapse, as the first responders were initially reluctant to save him. They feared that the building could crumble further and at the point where he was trapped. It was only at the insistence of other workers that the rescuers ultimately got him out. With each floor up, destruction was more severe and more challenging to handle. The fear grew that the tragedy was fatal. Moving up the ninth floor, we got one person heavily uh, trapped. Not sure on condition of the victim. We're getting a report from one of the workers. There might be somebody in the roof, so we're going to go head up there. The reporters quickly spread the news about the accident, reaching the workers' families. Hundreds of frightened wives and mothers gathered at the scene to wait for their loved ones to be recovered from the building. In the immediate response, the news reported one casualty, but the rescue teams feared there could be more. Among the people who came to the site was Nova Magretti. She and her sister-in-law camped in front of the construction site deep into the night, refusing to leave until her husband, Anthony, came out. Anthony was not even supposed to work that day, but he signed in as the family was in need of money. Time passed and more and more workers were evacuated, some of them being taken away by ambulance. But Nova was still waiting for her husband. Anthony would never come out though. His body was recovered the following day, making him the first identified victim of the disaster. The same day, the responders found another body, but could not recover it. Once the rescue mission was over, one more worker was missing. Neither his location nor status was known. It would later turn out that he died. Since only a portion of the building collapsed, many workers avoided injury. Of the 30 who were hospitalized, all but one were released the following day. To the agony of their families, they were left to lie in the building ruins until the city found a way to demolish the structure safely. The tragedy shocked the public. The men working on the site were outraged. It turned out that the disaster wasn't as unexpected as everyone thought. For days, workers feared that the building would come down on them. Soon, the people of New Orleans were to find out the harrowing truth behind the suspicions. The tragedy at the Hard Rock Hotel was an unprecedented accident in the modern history of New Orleans. The case of the building collapsing on its own caught the attention of the authorities and the broader public. While rescue operations were still in progress, the Department of Labor's Occupational Safety and Health Administration or OSHA, started investigating the causes of the collapse. In April 2020, OSHA cited Heaslip Engineering, Citadel Builders, Hub Steel, and eight subcontractors for safety and health violations at the construction site of a planned Hard Rock Hotel in downtown New Orleans. Most of the blame was put on Heaslip Engineering, LLC, for willfully making severe design flaws that affected the structural integrity of the building on the upper floors. These included under-designed floor beams on the 16th floor regarding their load capacity and exceeded spans between the cantilevers on the 17th and 18th floors. 
Collectively, the companies were fined $315,536 in penalties. Eastlip Engineering denied all allegations. The public was eager to go deeper into OSHA's findings and reveal how the disaster happened and whether there was a way to prevent it. A hint was given by a video published by one of the Hard Rock Hotel construction site workers. The video, made just a few days before the collapse, clearly showed distorted shoring poles under the weight of the concrete slab they were holding. Several of these were recorded throughout the entire floor, some appearing to be heavily bent. Workers were worried that the slab lacked proper structural support and would collapse. One of them, Delmer Joel Ramirez Palma, repeatedly expressed his co-workers' concerns to superiors, but was always sent off and told to go back to work. Another worker who claimed to have expressed his concerns regarding the structural integrity of the building was Brad Morrow, a supervisor for one of the contractors. Moro took dozens of photos of the improperly fitted steel support beams and showed them to his superiors. There was no response. In the end, Moro left the project after the 10th floor was built. The findings sparked a further public investigation. David Hammer, investigative journalist for the New Orleans TV station WWL-TV, made an inquiry of his own by getting insight into public records concerning the building of the Hard Rock Hotel. He also consulted experienced construction experts in his research and came to some stunning revelations. The starting point of the investigation was a video posted by a passerby that shows the 17th and the 18th floor, the two topmost floors collapsing together. It indicated that it was the 16th floor that caved in. Further investigation of the document showed that the decision to replace the steel beams with thinner ones was made in 2018. Namely, the designer made changes to the plan at the time according to the investor's wish to have a penthouse with high ceilings. The modified plan exceeded the approved height of the building by 15 feet. However, since the city decided not to approve the height modification, Designers resorted to what they believed was a creative solution. They replaced the 21-inch thick supporting steel beams on the 16th and 17th floor with 10-inch thick, thus gaining 11 inches of clearance per floor. The modification wouldn't have compromised the structural integrity of the building if designers had added more supporting columns and subsequently reduced the span between the beams. Instead of the original 11 columns, modified plans should have included at least 24 columns in the collapsed section. There were only 12. Moreover, these 12 columns were thinner and had less load capacity than the original columns. To gain more space, designers intentionally overstressed the 16th floor. That was the reason why the shoring poles from the video were bent. The floor was too heavy for the structure underneath it. To add to the underdesign of the top floor structure, engineers also replaced the original metal decking with one of lower quality. Metal decking, a sheet of high-performance galvanized steel, is used in the construction of composite concrete floor slabs by pouring concrete onto the metal deck to create a durable, integrated floor. Original building plans included heavier and sturdier 18-gauge metal deckings for top floors which were at some point replaced with cheaper but thinner 22-gauge decking. Experts engaged by WWL-TV found out about it by browsing the mail correspondence between designers and their suppliers. However, no such alterations in the building design were ever submitted to the city. Evidence provided by Brad Morrow, the supervisor who protested against the quality of work on the building, was the most shocking visually. Moro took dozens of photos showing vertical steel beams that were not connected to supporting columns. With beams attached to only one column, the structure was twice as weak. All of these flaws ultimately contributed to the massive underdesign of the 16th floor, which became overstressed once the 18th floor slab was made. On the day of the disaster, it simply gave in and collapsed.
With all the facts that led to the tragedy revealed, a series of questions arose. How come no one noticed them earlier? Where were the city building inspectors? They should have seen these structural flaws. A joint WWL-TV Times-Picayune investigation conducted in February 2020 found that the three city inspectors responsible for overseeing the Hard Rock Hotel construction repeatedly failed to appear at the site. For example, on six instances during 2019, Inspector Julie Tweeter filed inspection reports even though GPS data from her vehicle showed she was nowhere near the construction site. On October 1st, she was supposed to inspect the subfloor of the 18th floor rooftop. Instead, she never appeared on site, but nevertheless approved of the pouring of concrete, which then happened on October 4th. Eight days later, the building collapsed. For months, the partially collapsed hotel remained untouched as city authorities and the investor debated between using explosives for implosion or traditional demolition. Meanwhile, closures of surrounding streets significantly impacted nearby businesses. Along with Anthony Magretti, two other workers, Jose Ponce Ariola and Quinion Wimberly, lost their lives. Their bodies were buried so deep under the rubble that the rescuers could not recover them. The public outcry was enormous, begging authorities to carry out the recovery efforts as soon as possible. For this reason, the city ultimately decided to demolish the building in a traditional fashion. Ten months after the collapse, the bodies of Jose Ponce Ariola and Quinion Wimberly were finally recovered and returned to their families. In January 2021, the demolition was completed and debris clearing began. In response to the disaster, the New Orleans District Attorney filed charges only against the three building inspectors on counts of filing false public records and malfeasance in office. Additionally, 40 injured workers filed a lawsuit against the developers and construction contractors. Three and a half years after the accident, both trials are still in process. Delmer Palma the worker who reported the flaws to his superiors and one of the key witnesses was detained as an undocumented worker and ultimately deported to his native Honduras. The site where the unfinished Hard Rock Hotel once stood now lies barren, telling a tragic tale of how cost-cutting measures resulted in the loss of three workers' lives. Watch this episode next if you found this video interesting. Please add a like and leave a comment if you want to support the channel.